In November of 2019, while driving on a regional road I'd gone down many times, my mind did something it never had before. It was raining, and I was coming around a bend to a greenlit intersection. I was signaling into a turning lane. There was a tight line of cars on either side of me like two walls, and as I started to turn, the road vanished. Even the car seemed to dissolve. There was nothing but an expanse extending away in every direction. I was suspended in the air above deep cavernous depths, and the storm clouds above had split. Light from above them lit the sky like fire, and a line of long shining threads came down and vanished into the abyss. It seemed to last much longer than it did, and by the time I had the sense to break, I had made the turn and was back on the road exactly as before. I only told two people about it. I described it as a vision of golden harp strings connecting heaven and hell. After that, I acted like it didn't happen. 2020 feels like the end of a cycle. When I look around me, that seems to be what everyone is saying, even if they don't use those words. But it's been very difficult over the past year to pay attention to what's been going on out there. It just feels like I've had much more, much stranger things going on personally. I'm not going to talk about politics or world events at all. To be honest, at this point, I'm content to let everyone else watch the news for me. None of that stuff really interests me. What's been going on for me this year is a long series of strange happenings, which I can't explain. And I just can't ignore them or keep them to myself anymore. So I have to say what's happened. And whatever happens after that is going to have to happen too. I'm not asking anyone to believe a word of anything I say, or believe anything I believe. In fact, to the best of your ability, stay skeptical. Because if there's some easy explanation that I'm missing, I'd like to hear it. All I want with this work is for you to look at what I'm looking at and see what you see. With that out of the way, let's begin. When the year began, I had just moved back home from a city I'd been living in with an ex-girlfriend. This relationship had ended on the 22nd of December, and by early January I'd moved everything back home. Things were going pretty well around that time. I regrouped quickly, reconnected with some old friends, and after a brief and tolerable depressive period, I seemed to be doing much better than I had in months. And then, about halfway through the month, Without any obvious reason at all, I stopped sleeping. A period of horrific insomnia began. It was so bad that I remember almost nothing from the months between January and May. For the first five days, there was no sleep at all. For the first five weeks, two hours a night, three when I was lucky. I could barely function, I was basically in a stupor. The problem seemed to be that as soon as I laid down, my heart began racing. This was highly unusual, and there was no reason for this. I wasn't stressed about anything. Sometimes my heart rate would more than double. It started accelerating and wouldn't stop. It would get so frantic that I had to get out of bed. Because as soon as I got out of bed, it would always go back to normal. This didn't end until the summertime, but by about mid-February, I could get about four or five hours in a night. But something wasn't right. This sleep was fragmented and dreamless. I woke up more than four times every night, sometimes as many as ten. The other thing, which I couldn't make any sense of, was what started happening at night. Something started talking. Now, this wasn't a hallucination. Schizophrenics usually insist that they hear voices. These voices are commonly described as male, usually reported to be hostile, forceful, repetitive, and interactive, meaning the sufferer can engage with them in conversation. What I began experiencing on those nights bore no resemblance to this. Instead, my own internal voice began talking at me. During these episodes, I could see blackness, I could feel the bed, I could tell if the room was warm or cool, but I didn't seem to be self-aware. I was awake, but I didn't seem to notice I was awake. 
almost as if under hypnosis. Then, my inner voice would begin speaking. It went on long explanatory rambles as if it were being asked questions, seemingly having half of a conversation with itself. And it didn't seem to be me doing it. I just observed it. I scoured insomnia forums looking for experiences like this. But I couldn't find any. Now, I don't know what was going on, especially because these experiences were very hard to recall. But consistently upon waking up, I felt these thoughts were not mine. It was like my inner voice was a sound system, and during the day, I was the one using it. And then at night, it started tuning in to something else. Now as for what this thing said, I could never really remember. Usually all I recalled was that it did speak, and maybe a few other fragmentary details. What I usually felt was that the voice had been telling me something. I tried to ignore how weird this was, and just treated it like an obstacle. I just wanted to sleep, and this thing would go on, sometimes for more than an hour. Then I would wake up, wired, but stupid, because I'd had nothing but four bad hours of broken sleep. Between June and when it started, I never slept more than five hours. I became delirious and desperate, and even though it didn't go on that long, I became paranoid that my brain was being damaged and that I was going to die. Probably an overreaction, but I was far past the point of thinking clearly. I started working with a sleep therapist. I told her my brain felt broken, like things that used to move just didn't anymore. I've often wondered if the insomnia caused these effects, the brain feelings, the paranoia, the talking, or if the insomnia was just the most obvious symptom of something else. There's no way to know at this point. I was sleeping by June. As far as I can tell looking through old records, things didn't start ramping up until late July. Sometime before then, I managed to get my hands on some psilocybin mushrooms. It had been about a year and a half since I'd taken any psychedelics, and for some reason, I felt I was in some kind of knot they might help me untie. What I did was insane. I would not advise it at all, and I don't know what convinced me to do it. The day before my birthday, I consumed somewhere between 8 and 10 grams of dried mushrooms. Then I sat down, blindfolded, and waited for whoever I'd just invited into my head to show up. It really began with the sounds. They were very odd and very clear and very hard to describe. The report I left described them as sounding structured and intentional, as if it were a language. And as it continued, I felt something coming closer. She seemed to form out of the patterns, slowly separating and taking shape. She wasn't human-like. She wasn't like anything. She moved gracefully and didn't speak. My intuition during this was that I wasn't seeing her. That this intelligence was using mental imagery and sensations to communicate. These communications intensified, gaining in speed and complexity, and as they went on, they began to feel more and more intelligible to me. My heart started racing, and then the next thing I recall is snapping to attention with a gasp and pulling off the blindfold. Two hours were gone. I have no recollection of whatever passed during that time. I got up and left the couch and made my way to my bedroom. It was pitch black because the blinds were drawn and I felt that someone else was inside, lying on the bed. I asked if anyone was there, but no answer came back. Just cold quiet and dread. When I went over to check, there was nobody just the covers all piled up on one side. I didn't seem to understand that it wasn't possible to sleep, so I tried to. This was a mistake. Something got its hands on me. It dragged me right out of my body into a pit of filth and agony. I seemed to vanish into it. The room was gone and there was no way out. I couldn't get him off of me, and he dragged me further and further down to the bottom of evil, 
and he made me look at it. It was trying to show me something. It was trying to show me what was growing under the floor and in the walls of the world. The thing trying to wriggle up out of the earth and into our skins so that it could live and breathe. A thing made of hunger, that wanted to make pain, because it liked the way it tasted. And the thing that took me there said, He wants to eat you all. When it finally ended, I left the bedroom. I felt shaken, terrified, and violated. But I understood why I had to see what I saw. I was disoriented, but I began to remember who and where I was, and what was going on. I felt something calling me to return to the couch, and put the blindfold back on. So I did. When I closed my eyes, it felt like I'd just awoken from a dream. I was suspended in space, but I was also inside of a gigantic structure, because one had been built all through the solar system. It's a hard thing to remember, and a harder thing to describe, but it seemed to be a machine of some kind. Not any kind of machine humans have imagined before. This thing was as alive as anything. It was like a vast, breathing temple. And I could feel that it was alive, and that it was glad to be alive, and that it was deeply wise. I was outside of it, and I could only see its walls and its shape. It was a whole landscape. It reached away farther than I could see. I really can't put into words how big this thing was. And something in me said, on the other side of those walls, the universe is awake. And it's finished. And it was worth it. There was an altar at the center with the sun on it, and around that were fish-shaped objects nearly as big as it was. They were circling together in concentric rings as if in some sort of grand celestial ritual. It was as real as anything I've ever seen. I floated through this solar temple, and as I went I drifted closer and closer inward toward the sun. My eyes adjusted and I saw a gigantic being within it. It was framed and enveloped by the fire, but I could see its form clearly as though the sun were only a window. There in the center was something called the Star of Glory. It was made of feathered wings fashioned from bright gold, all extending from a point of blinding light. There were no discernible features other than these. It was just light and six wings. I felt that this had been the thing calling, that it had always been calling, that it was the very thing at the end of time calling the present to the future. And then it spoke. Let die he who would die. He who would live shall live against all odds. As soon as it spoke, I was thrown out into space. The vision faded into blackness, and I could not call it back. I went to the mirror and I saw my pupils were normal. It was over. Now this experience really made an impact on me. I wrote what the star said right away, and then recorded the whole thing. I'd never heard of anything quite like it. I'd heard plenty of DMT stories where people spoke with things, but very rarely had I heard of people coming back with the things those things said. Usually the whole thing seemed to dissolve. And when they didn't, they didn't sound like this. The most noticeable thing about the star had been its shape. Six wings, no body, no face. In the report I called it the angel. Something about it felt really real, so I looked up six-winged angels. As it happens, accounts of such things do exist. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Isaiah 6-2 I'd actually seen depictions of seraphim when I was a kid, but they looked like this, and I didn't know what they were called. What I saw didn't look like this. It looked somewhere between this and this. The seraph which I saw sounds to me more like what Isaiah described. What struck me most of all, though, was not this consistency. It was the Hebrew meaning of the word seraph. It means the burning one. At that time, and for a while before, I'd been studying Gnosticism, a dead form of ancient Christianity. 
Despite my best efforts, church Christianity had kind of spat me out, but there was something in it I didn't want to lose. My interest drew me to Abraxas, the god of Basilides, and out of this fascination would come something alien. Abraxas is a rather strange image. Two snakes for feet, the body of a soldier, and the head of a rooster. I never really liked this image, not until after the vision of the angel. But then, something shifted, and I became obsessed with the thing. The name, in Greek isophony, adds up to 365, the number of days in the year. The number of letters is 7, the number of days in the week. So there's a deliberate connection to cycles of time, specifically, to my eye, with the ending and beginning of cycles. These are the Abraxas gems. He must have been important to the Gnostics, because there's a lot of them. And I found all of a sudden I had to know what it meant, because it was one of the weirdest things I'd ever seen, and it didn't seem like it could mean anything, and yet I couldn't stop thinking about it. The psychologist Carl Jung, who had interests similar to mine, wrote of Abraxas, This is a god whom ye know not, for mankind forgot it. We name it by its name Abraxas. It is more indefinite still than god and devil. Abraxas standeth above the sun and above the devil. It is force, duration, change. Doesn't really answer many questions, does it? It didn't for me either. The egg did crack eventually, though. And on the 5th of August, I posted my conclusions on the Gnostic subreddit in the thread titled Symbolic Analysis of Abraxas. To summarize my interpretation, the two snakes symbolize chaos, conflict, and the animal instinct. This is nature, and symbolically, legs and feet always represent connection to the earth. The armor represents civilization, order, and the conquering side of the human spirit. It holds a whip representing force, and a shield representing mercy. The rooster's head symbolizes the morning, meaning creation, illumination, and wisdom. On the whole, it represents balance, chaos under order, and order under wisdom. The reason it was so opaque and hard to grasp was because it was trying to contain all opposites. Inexplicably, after I figured this out, I started making something. I was like a spider spinning a web. I didn't know what I was doing or why I started doing it. And when I began this, I opened a doorway and something came in. In the language of symbolism, a cosmogram is a symbolic image representing all of reality. This is what I started working on. My first outline looked like this. I deleted the original, but this is very close. However, as soon as I started the project, something extremely strange began happening. The sleep problems came back, and the talking voice came back with them. We were still pretty locked down then, so I had nothing but time. For a week, I did almost nothing except work on the cosmogram. I would barely eat, I would in fact forget to eat, and usually did all my eating at the end of the day. The rest of the time, I worked frantically. I was back to five hours of dreamless sleep, and at night, the inner voice started talking on its own again. It would explain the symbolism, how it all connected, make corrections, and give instructions on what to do next. When I woke up, all of this was forgotten. But when I went back each day, new ideas seemed to fill my head as soon as I sat down. I couldn't recall what the voice had said, but I did seem to know. I'm not an artist, so I gathered free images from around the web and made the image out of them. At the end of a week, it was basically done. The sleep problems went away again. Over the course of a few more weeks, it was all I dreamed about. In those dreams, I would meet characters who suggested final alterations. And at the end of it all, the Abraxian Cosmogram was finished. After making the image, I felt that something in me had changed, and that I'd found a kind of master key. It's a cross, the cycles of the year, a zodiac wheel, and the four suits of the tarot. But I noticed something a bit disconcerting. Over the course of a few days, I found more symbolism, which I hadn't put there. 
The pentagram is a very old symbol. It goes back to Pythagoras, and it represents a human being. It even has some history in Christianity. It's only a satanic symbol when you invert it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do that. There's an almost perfect pentagram here, and I didn't find it until it was already there. That probably seems a bit inconsequential. But there's more, and they start to add up. In Eastern Christianity, the skull of Adam has traditionally been depicted under the cross. I did not know this when I put a skull here. The Kabbalah's tree of life is divided into three pillars. The pillar of severity, the pillar of mercy, and the pillar of harmony. Abraxas holds the whip in the pillar of severity and the shield in the pillar of mercy. This was discovered by accident because I noticed the two circles in the Taijitu in the outline could be lined up with the spheres at the bottom of the tree. The tree is further divided into the four worlds, Asaya, Yetzera, Bria, and Atsilut. I didn't know that, but I drew the boundaries right. In Egyptian iconography, the Ankh, or Key of Life, represents life itself. Egypt is actually where Abraxas comes from. With the cross, this crown of thorns forms an onk. This onk is also accidental. I was most surprised of all, though, when the temple showed up. Solomon's temple was divided into three sections. The portico, the porch outside. The main hall, or holy place, where the people could go. And then there was the Holy of Holies, which was where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. It was hidden behind a veil which only the priests were allowed behind. On the portico, there were two freestanding pillars named Boaz and Jachin, representing the left and right hands of God. The three divisions, the meaning of the divisions, the pillars, and the hands, were all correctly placed according to this scheme. I had never seen or thought about the Temple of Solomon before. It came as a shock to me that the experience of creating this thing came with the sense that I was receiving external instructions. And then sure enough, I didn't have to look very far to find secret images that I didn't put there. I felt that something else did this, something far more intelligent than I was, and based on its affinity for sacred imagery, something I was willing to give the benefit of the doubt. On the last day of August... I took psychedelics again, hoping this thing would reveal itself and possibly communicate like the things last time had. This time, LSD. What happened that night was the most profound and terrifying experience I've ever had. Everything I've done since, I've done because of what I saw. I had a vision of a void outside of time and space. In it, a sphere of total light and a sphere of total darkness. Up from below, the black sphere was rising as the light descended, and each was moving towards the other. Something about this was completely overpowering. It felt like lightning was pouring into me through my eyes and filling my veins. There was nothing anyone could have said to make me look away from it. I felt like I was exploding and contracting at the same time, like a single force was pulling me apart and crushing me, and I was suspended in the middle of it, shaking. I could feel all of infinity screaming in my bones. And as the black sphere rose, the light shone brighter and brighter. And suddenly the sphere of light was shaking and howling and bands of color rippled around it. I saw now that what I had thought was fire were not flames at all. It was entirely covered in glowing arms. And they were all beckoning and reaching and grasping at the black sphere of silence below. It shone brighter and brighter as it enveloped the darkness. And then the two spheres became one. One black pit shining with infinite blinding light. And in that light, I could see the beginning and the end of time. The forming of all things and their undoing, all pouring out of a roaring, unknowable depth. A single, indescribable infinity expressed as shining darkness. I stared into that void, unable to look away. And I felt it staring back. The moment lasted forever. And as we looked at each other, I felt a need to laugh and cry, and scream all at once. It seemed to be beauty and terror itself, and I knew then, to a certainty, that this was the thing that made the world. And this vision had been prefigured, just days before, 
in the Cosmogram. For several hours, I spoke with something that claimed to be an angel. It explained things I had not known and provided another vision. It showed me a solar eclipse in the sky. It looked like a hole, and out of that hole there poured water. This water was pitch black, but shining at its edges like the eclipse itself. There was chaos in the world below, and the water engulfed everything. It flooded cities and towns and drowned the world. But in the midst of it, there were people who the waters parted around and who were not touched by it. They brought people with them to high ground and fought off others who they left behind. The angel said the end of a cycle was coming, said it would end in December, and gave instructions about how to proceed. Among all it said, one thing seemed out of place. It said, when my phone broke, I should not get another one. I thought this was a strange thing to tack on to everything else it said, given the gravitas and atmosphere of the whole ordeal. My phone broke the next day. Somehow, it fell out of my car door when I was getting in. The screen is unusable now. Needless to say, it will not be replaced. I don't really know what happened the night of that trip, but it ruptured the fabric of my reality. A couple things about what the angel said. It actually gave a lot of good advice. In the first place, it cautioned against becoming obsessed with all of this. It told me nobody else would believe me yet, so I should not discuss it. And in the meantime, get in shape and start dressing nice, so that when it came time to talk, I would look more credible. And it told me to become as disciplined as possible. Usually, contact with entities doesn't happen at normal LSD doses. And most madmen are not given this sort of advice by the things they talk to. Usually, they push them further and further into their own heads. I've spoke with some Christians who told me I talked to a demon. However, the first epistle of John contradicts them. Chapter 4. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Now, I actually didn't believe this myself. I read the death and resurrection as symbolic. This angel told me I was wrong. It claimed this story was literally true, and in fact convinced me that night, saying, He is the axle of the world, the eclipse of flesh and spirit, and claimed, Words cannot touch him. No explanation of him can be offered which is not false. Immediately after the experience, I started seeing a lot of triple numbers. I didn't talk about it, I just noticed them. They were on clocks, license plates, and any other random number strings. I didn't count phone numbers or prices, because those are often triple sequences. I also ignored zeros, so things like a thousand, for example, were not considered triple sequences. But even ignoring those, it was every day for months. Three or more, usually more, often as many as ten. This one, from October, felt like a wink. In September, I had left for university. Other than the numbers, that month was mostly uneventful. I started reading the Bible, which I didn't expect to enjoy as much as I did. I ate healthier than I ever have and started working out every day. But I mostly stuck to school, did well, and the weirdness took a back seat. Except for the dreams. It started with a dream about driving. I was driving with a passenger I didn't know. She was the same being as the female thing from the mushrooms. But she wasn't a pattern anymore, just a blonde. She was giving me directions as I drove, explaining more connections in the cosmogram and suggesting some finishing touches. She'll show up again later. In late September or early October, I got a strange intuition that the numbers had something to do with stars. Sometimes, there was even a feeling that this activity was the stars talking. Now, this sounded insane and made me worried about my health. It, it was not at all an idea I wanted to entertain, so I pushed it right out of my head like anyone would. All my courses were online, so I went home for a week in October. While doing a dream reading from my mother, she asked me completely out of nowhere if I had been seeing a large amount of triple numbers. 
I didn't answer right away, I just asked when they started, and she told me, right when I left for school. These seemed to begin for me in direct response to the angel experience, and hers had begun at exactly the same time. For me, this was my confirmation that things really were happening outside of my head. It was in response to this that I started reading more of Carl Jung, who you might remember wrote that stuff about Abraxas. He also wrote about weird coincidences and dream analysis, so he seemed like the guy to be reading at the time. Jung had pioneered a technique for communicating with characters from dreams called active imagination. You visualize the character and a scene, and if you could maintain a lucid, focused, open state, you could interact with them, and they would act autonomously. I started doing this every night and recording my results. Unfortunately, the early reports aren't dated, but I know roughly when they happened. I was not overly hopeful about active imagination, but things got really weird really fast. I met with the woman from before several times, who started taking me places. One of the first was the Garden of Eden. The report reads, I appeared in Eden surrounded by huge trees, giraffes, and elephants. There was a large angel who passed through made of light, walking amid the trees, so tall his head was hidden by clouds. The woman led us to a large stone pool with a gargoyle fountain. A lion sat in the shade watching us close by, as we undressed and sat down in the hot water. Something I didn't catch until a few days later, although I should have, was that this vision was of a man and woman entering Eden and undressing. Effectively, the story of the fall in reverse. Another report. She took us into a crypt and said my imagination is much older than I think. She led us through a long stone tunnel carrying a torch and said, it lives and it breathes. What she seemed to be claiming was that imagination is not in our heads, but is an external medium which people can tap into. I didn't believe her. She led me into a chamber containing a winged lion made of stone. The statue looked ancient. It came to life and stepped off its pedestal to reveal a hole in the wall. She gave me her torch and urged me on to the tunnel. She said she would meet me down there. The tunnel was pitch black and inside was a steep drop. I dropped the torch which fell a long way down, landed, burned for a little, then snuffed itself out. I climbed all the way down this shaft of rock into another tunnel, and at the end was a light coming up from the floor. When I reached this light, I found it was a hole into a secret room, in which a golden chalice flew into my hand with feathery wings, which then disappeared. She told me this was the Holy Grail. I wrote, I should mention before I forget how vivid the Grail was. I could see my reflection plain as day warped across the curved gold. It was real. I mean, it was one of the realest things I've ever imagined. She poured it full of wine and we drank. Then she offered bread. I realized she was reenacting the Last Supper, and I became instantly suspicious. I asked if we should be doing what we were. She nodded at the grail, and without a moment's hesitation or even the briefest flash of worry, said, You've already done it. We ate the bread, and when we left that chamber, a steel door slammed shut and sealed itself behind us, and I had the feeling that it would not open again for a very long time. Later, when I asked her what the whole thing meant, she said, It means itself. There is no hidden meaning. Two days later, while working in a common area in residence, I was struck spontaneously by a vision. It was so forceful and so clear that my actual sense of sight seemed obscured by it. It was of a mountain and a golden sky. Around its base were reptiles devouring one another, and above that was a ring of lions eating gazelles, wolves eating lambs, and other mammals eating mammals. Above that, chimpanzees ripping each other apart as they do, Above that, two armies of ancient soldiers spearing one another, and at the very top was a bloody and beaten man on the brink of death, holding a dove as high above him as he could. This vision had a profound, indescribable effect on me. I was incapacitated by both grief and wonder, and had to return to my dorm to avoid drawing attention to myself. Upon sitting down at my desk, I was possessed by a creative fever, and went into a kind of trance, and I wrote something. 
The work was originally composed as an unbroken block of text, because I felt if I stopped writing to format it, I would lose it. It went, Lo the Father enthroned on high, and from him all the world proceeds. Lo the void the womb below, and to her all the world is given. Lo the spirit who cometh down, lo the flesh who riseth up. Strife the many, and peace the one. Ascend, O moon, into the sun. Eclipse his eye, thy will be done. Lo Abraxas, to thy pupil cometh sight, for from thy shadow shineth light. This is not the kind of thing I tend to write. That should go without saying. The grail vision had occurred only days before, and so, for whatever reason, I decided to title the poem Reflection in the Grail. I've never been good at titling things, and that was the last interesting thing that happened to me. Also, it just seemed to fit. Then I decided to format it properly. I typed it all out, separated the lines, double-spaced, and centered it. When it was all said and done, it looked like this. Remember that the dream woman at the start of the Grail Vision had sought to convince me that all this was not coming from my own mind. Two days later, as far as I'm concerned, the proof had arrived. During some of this, I had been reading one of Carl Jung's strangest works, Ion. This was a book which a peculiar nudge from fate had drawn me to. Ion examines the history, development, and present decline of Christianity from Jung's psychological framework. This book is an extremely difficult and dense one, and its thesis is practically impossible to summarize. But the book is very good, and there are lots of good summaries of it out there. But I'll cover what you need to know as it becomes necessary. Now, I knew nothing about this book other than its title at the time of my angel trip. Yet somehow, Jung predicted, just as my angel had, that a cycle of history would end in December of 2020. This is a book I had not read, published in 1951. My drug-induced prophecy had aligned perfectly with that of a man writing almost 70 years earlier. And this man, of course, was the root and stem of my Abraxian cosmogram, not by any means an insignificant connection. I'll start with some background. There is an astronomical phenomenon known as axial precession. In 72 years, every star in the sky will move by one degree. This is because of the way the Earth wobbles on its axis, and the result is that approximately every 2,000 years, the sun rises in a different constellation at the vernal equinox. It moves backwards through the zodiac. Astrologers call these astrological ages, but they've also been known in the past as ions. I want to mention at this point that I knew nothing of and disliked astrology until this year. And it was only this book and my own weird experiences that opened me up to it. I still think horoscopes are a bit silly, but I can no longer deny that there's something to the whole thing. Here's why. About 2,000 years ago, the Ion of Pisces began, almost at exactly the time of the birth of Christ. Now, whether you believe in Christianity or not, there are certain objective facts about this period which cannot be denied. Notice, for example, that Christ feeds the 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. Pisces is two fish. His friends are fishermen. Matthew 4.19 And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. One of the early Christian symbols was the sign of the fish. You've probably seen it. This sign was adopted because the letters of the word for fish in Greek, ichthys, can spell out Jesus Christ, God's Son, the Savior. It's an acronym. It's not an astrological reference. And it was adopted as a Christian symbol because it was illegal in the Roman Empire to be more overtly Christian. Jung writes, we have no reason whatever to suppose that the stories in the Bible are disguised astrological myths, citing a lack of evidence for any such idea. Edward Edinger, who wrote the Ion Lectures, says the same. His representation as a fish was not caused by any general knowledge that the sun had moved into Pisces. 
This fish symbolism comes apparently out of nowhere, exactly when the Ion of Pisces begins. One should also note that Christ is said to be born of a virgin, and directly opposite to Pisces is Virgo, the constellation of the Virgin. The same thing is seen with Moses. Moses lived in the Ion of Ares and was the judge of Israel, founding its law and establishing the rule of the judges. Opposite to Ares is Libra, the scales. Okay, so now we can move on to Jung's prophecy. Now, there is this thing called the Great Conjunction, which is when Saturn and Jupiter align with the Earth. This forms a very bright star in the sky, and astrologically, Jupiter and Saturn symbolize, approximately, abundance and limitation, respectively. So the conjunction is considered a total union of opposites. It was calculated by the astronomer Kepler that one such conjunction would have occurred at the beginning of the Ion of Pisces in about 7 BC, in the constellation of Pisces. When the Magi arrive in Bethlehem at the birth of Jesus, they claim to have followed a star, the star of Bethlehem. Matthew 2.2 they said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Young notes that on December 21st, 2020, these planets will align again. They will be closer than they have been in about 400 years. This time, for the first time, both in the Ion of Aquarius and the constellation of Aquarius. This would seem to symbolize, assuming it means anything, the final conclusion of the Ion of Pisces. December 21st of this year, the angel told me the end of a cycle would arrive in December. How did it know? I didn't. Like I said, I paid astrology no mind at all before any of this, and I hadn't read Ion. When I learned this, I was in a coffee shop, and in the span of about two hours, I saw almost 20 triple numbers outside on license plates, just in chance glances out the window. The alignment of these opposing planets reminded me of my eclipse vision, which also seemed to symbolize a total union of opposites. I had a strange hunch to look up when the next solar eclipse was going to happen. And I found out. December 14th, 2020. Seven days off from Jung's conjunction. As of uploading this, it happened today, over South America. And... In case you didn't know, and wanted to know, the constellation of Aquarius is a cup-bearer, and opposite to Aquarius is Leo, the lion, the grail, and the lion. I felt like I was going to lose my mind. My psyche just couldn't take it anymore. Everything I thought reality was was unraveling before my eyes, and it was such a long, convoluted story. Impossible to tell straight, and impossible for any person to believe. I wanted to drop it, to just let it go, but I couldn't do that. So I took LSD again in an attempt to either speak with the angel or find some reason to think that I was just delusional. Sure enough, I saw the eclipse again, and the angel returned. This experience stands out even among the others. It was the clearest the communications and visions had ever been. Now, I won't go into it here, but the angel gave plain and decisive instructions. Write it all down, and let it be heard by all who would hear it. It told me to make this video and upload it on this date. I asked how I could prove what I was saying was true. It told me the pyramids would be the proof. It took a little bit, but I figured out what that meant. The Great Pyramid of Giza is the most precisely oriented structure on the face of the planet. The north face of the pyramid is aligned to true north only off by about 3 sixtieths of a degree. The Great Pyramid's 146.6 meter height, when multiplied by exactly 1 billion, equals the distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is 147 million kilometers. It's about 6 million tons. Multiply that by exactly 1 quintillion, and you get the Earth's mass, about 6 septillion tons. If you take the height of the pyramid, again 146.6 meters, and the perimeter of the pyramid, about 920 meters, and you multiply both of those numbers by 43,200, those numbers respectively correspond almost exactly with the polar radius of the Earth and the equatorial circumference of the Earth. 43,200 seems like a pretty random number. It almost seems like it was pulled out of nowhere just to make the math work, but it wasn't. There's way more going on than that. 43,200 is 72 multiplied by 600. That means it's 6 plus 6 times 6 times 600. There are 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, and 24 hours in a day. 6 times 4, 24. There are 12 months in a year. 6 times 2, 12. The average month has 30 days. 6 times 5, 30. A leap year is 6 times 61 days. 
Six-sided hexagons can be tiled, and if you try and tile circles, triangles, or rhombi, they all form hexagons. Molecules form in overwhelmingly hexagonal structures. Six elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, comprise 98% of all living matter. Carbon, the most important of those six, is element number six. Arrange carbon atoms into six-sided hexagons and you get graphene, the strongest material known to man. If you multiply any number by six and add the digits together until you only have one, they'll always add up to three, six, or nine. Cubes have six sides, one for each of the six directions of 3D space. There are six full radians in a circle, and a circle contains 360 degrees. Six times 60, 360. And for some reason, if you multiply the measurements of the Great Pyramid by six plus six times six times 600, you get the proportions of the planet. And this is the structure more perfectly oriented than any other on the face of the Earth. 6 plus 6 times 6 is 72. And as I've said, every 72 years, the orientation of the Earth's axis shifts by one degree. One begins to wonder how random anything really is. To me, the Great Pyramid appears, at the very least, to be a monument to the belief that nothing is. Now, you might be asking, what do the pyramids have to do with any of this? Well, besides being in the same part of the world Abraxas originated in, there are three pyramids. They're a reflection of the constellation of Orion's belt. Orion's belt is three stars in a line. Well, the thing I'd kept seeing since September were sets of three numbers in a line. And since October, I'd had this weird feeling that it had something to do with stars. That's what the triple numbers meant. They were Orion's belt. And that's what the pyramids are. Now, I'm aware that I've mentioned a lot of sixes, and I don't want to be accused of being the beast. As a matter of fact, I don't want to be accused of being anything. I'm just following the instructions that I was given. But to clarify, here's what 666 and the beast are, because the angel also told me that. In the story of Genesis, the world is made in six days. Man is made on the sixth, and six appears to be central to the structure of mathematics. 666 symbolizes the world, man, and math. It's science. That's what it's talking about. Reductive, materialistic science that says there is no God and everything is random. Which has gotten really good at looking at the world, but still hasn't figured out how to listen to it. That's the beast the people worship. Six represents the world, one represents God. That's why seven is the number of wholeness. So with that out of the way, here's my prediction for the Great Conjunction. On December 21st, 2020, God will show up. Now I don't mean there will be a flash in the sky. As a matter of fact, I kind of doubt very much will happen at all. Not right away. Here's what I mean. There's a reason Christmas falls on the 25th. It's because it's close to the winter solstice. The winter solstice is the longest and darkest night of the year. After that, the days grow longer and light returns to the world. The solstice is December 21st. So this year, in the age of Aquarius, in the constellation of Aquarius, the star of Bethlehem will appear on the year's longest night, brighter than it has been in four centuries. And I believe anyway, that after that, there will be a shift, and the tide will turn. And I believe the reason it will, is because you've heard all of this. I have it on good authority that that's how it's going to work. And after the year I've had, I don't have it in me to doubt it. Welcome to the new ion. I hope you have a Merry Christmas and a Happy 2021. Thank you for watching, and be well.